Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the gospel lesson just read, the parable of the shrewd steward. You will see that though the stuff and things of this life may come and go, in the kingdom of God, every personal loss is leverage for eternal gain. Again, Jesus commends the resilience of a steward about to lose it all. I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So far the text, let us pray. O Lord Jesus, bless thy word that we may trust in thee. Amen. A good number of my conversations throughout the week involve a gentle coaxing of individuals out of worst-case scenarios. From the milder forms of worry where you simply need to vent to the more intense circular arguments where absolutely convinced the very worst sits on the horizon. Any breath I take to offer evidence to the contrary is rejected as outright foolishness on my part. Now scripture does teach to have genuine concern for the consequences of how your actions might or might not affect others. But to be ruled by that which has yet to happen holds you hostage to a future no one knows, except God. Which has to be the most frustrating part of trying to draw someone out of these dark clouds of our own making, that however much I'd love to say there must be a different explanation, oh, that won't happen, no one will think any less of you. I can't claim to know the future any better than anyone else. But the parable we consider this morning teaches you how to break the cycle. A man has been given two weeks notice, so to speak, about to lose his job as bookkeeper and debt collector of his master's accounts, he put out most about in despair, spiraling out into the unknown. Instead, he honestly looks his losses head on. What shall I do? I'm in no condition for physical labor. I'm too proud to beg. This right here is all I have. So simply accepting his situation as unchangeable reality, he resolves to make the most of what he does have left, hatching a plan whereby he uses his final workday to cut his client's bills nearly in half in order to build connections for the next stage of his life that, as he calculates out loud, they may receive me into their houses. There's no worst case scenario here. No talking his situation out in a word for word best construction. He considers only his strengths and abilities that current moment in time and thereby seizes his personal setback as opportunity for gain. What's the worst that could happen? I have nothing to lose. All that other wandering of the mind in need of gentle coaxing is some form of false witness an assumption of the worst on the part of others in your life. An assumption of the worst 
on the part of your God. A worse construction mindset, which, which can only bring imaginary fears to life. Like when the anxiety that you might make someone uncomfortable makes you creep about in a manner which makes them uncomfortable. When your personal setbacks blind you to the abundance of everything you still have. To do nothing to resolve a situation because it'll never get any better. And guess what? It doesn't. In all this sin, avoiding any real accountability on my part. Under the guise of self-pity, blaming everybody and everything else. All of which reverts back to the behavior of Adam and Eve, their first moments after the fall. It's in this context that Jesus commends a man, a man who, mind you, we have no reason to believe was all that pious an individual, commends a man who can actually get over himself and make the most of the little he still had. In this sense, Jesus says, the children of this world prove themselves wiser than the children of light. Or in other words, why can't you, children of the kingdom and inheritors of eternal life, act a little more like him? It's a peculiar parable we consider today one in which Jesus bluntly tells you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps, dust yourself off, and make the most of it. It isn't the only case Jesus spoke in downright direct fashion. Take no thought for the morrow. Why get yourselves all worked up about stuff that may or may not happen? In general, Jesus found himself surrounded by the kind of people who had nothing to lose. Throughout the four Gospels, the blind, deaf, and paralyzed seemed more drawn to him than the able-bodied, troubled souls who embraced their worst as the point from which it could only get better. And the times Jesus did remove the worldly burdens of those who came to him he did so in order to clear and refocus the mind on saving truth. Thy faith hath saved thee. Because it's through faith alone that you can look past all worry and dread of what may or may not be to see how Jesus used his final work day among us sinners to broker a deal no one else could. A transaction which has redeemed you from every it'll never get better and what's the point by settling your debt of sin as a whole. To human eye, it was a scheme accomplished in shrewd, underhanded manner. 30 pieces of silver coupled with a trial riddled with worse construction testimony. But from God's perspective, as scripture makes plain, all gone down in open, clear fashion. For with his final breaths, Jesus put every strength and ability of the unchanging riches of his righteousness to full use, by rendering the priceless treasure of his holy precious blood and innocent sufferings and death to purchase and win you from all sin's death and the power of the devil. 
You see, in that deal, brokered by the shrewd steward, take thy bill and cut it in half, he makes a few friends by giving them a break. But Jesus, who laid down his life for friend and enemy alike, his word declares a full reconciliation between you and your God. Take thy bill and rip it to shreds. The real worst case scenario the sinner should fear is no empty bank account, nor poor opinion in the eyes of man. No, with the absolute worst that could happen to you, an eternal separation from your God and every good thing he gives, removed from the picture entirely by the Savior who died for your transgressions and rose again for your justification, there is now no thing you lack in him. As the apostle declares, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? A friend of Jesus, at peace with your creator, an inheritor of everlasting habitations through the forgiveness of sins, what is the worst that could possibly now happen to you? As the apostle declares, I am persuaded that nothing, neither death nor life, shall be able to separate us from this love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You and I tiptoe, gently coax one another out of worst case fears. The gospel alone bears the authority to yank, yank you out of those dark clouds of your own making and ground you back into rea eternal reality. With a counter argument, only Jesus can get away with. What? Did you die? No. But I did and rose from death so that you never will. Yes, I find a good number of my conversations throughout the week involve worst case scenarios. This kind of work is not unique to being a pastor. On account of sin, these are hurdles you encounter in any line of work and home life. If you're honest, it's a daily struggle with yourself. And if it's not, maybe you're the one arguing with those trying to draw you out of it. But the plain wisdom we learn from our parable is to look those darkest fears head on. What is the worst that can happen? He or she never talks to me again. I end up looking a fool. I lose every penny to my name. This is scary at first, downright terrifying. But it's the only way to recognize these worst constructions for what they are. The assumption of evil on the part of God and those he's given you to love. Only by surrendering these imaginary worsts over to the Savior who promises to use all things for your eternal good, can faith begin to make the best construction most of what once held you hostage. Again, the apostle, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. stuff and things of this life, they might come and go. But in the kingdom of God, your every personal loss becomes leverage for eternal gain. Well, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. The problem, then, isn't any temporal good or thing, but our obsession over what they might mean. 
as if you gaining or losing in this world says something about your personal worth. As we sang, the world is sorely grieved whenever it is slighted, or when its hollow fame and honor have been blighted. The faith embraces, even when things seem on the brink of collapse, the Lord's firm rebuke to refocus yourself on your true worth in him. Christ, thy reproach I bear, long as it pleaseth thee. I'm honored by my Lord. What is the world to me? Jesus doesn't teach against the riches of this life. He's the one who gives them to you. And to be frank, anyone with enough gas in the tank or Wi-Fi in the house to be listening to this sermon today, to you it has been given in grand abundance. Use the last of your mammon these last few days before Christ's return for the clever endeavor of making to yourselves friends for the everlasting habitations to come. Don't fear risking a little reputation or wealth along the way. With nothing to lose, there's only opportunity for patience, humility, and perseverance to shine. The kind of treasures which go far in giving others hope in their setbacks, thereby making the most of whatever situation you find yourself in for eternal gain. Which brings us back to the peculiar example Jesus makes of the shrewd steward. Can't you act a little more like him? Yes, I suppose I can. May his stubborn resilience to keep his belly full be for you a genuine fruit of faith, a confidence in the overwhelming and irrevocable treasures yours as children of light. Now the peace that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.